Welcome to Behind the Doc Lens. I'm your host, Olga Medvedev-Young. Joining us today is Eric Spangy. He is an award-winning documentary film producer, director, and writer who specializes in the subjects of history and science. His work has been broadcast on PBS, the Discovery Channel, and BBC. Before becoming a filmmaker, he wrote about art and culture for top publications, including the New York Times, the Boston Globe, and the Atlantic Monthly. He's here today to discuss his documentary, Murder at Harvard, a historical whodunit with Simon Shama. This is Behind the Dark Lens. He would make up scenes, fictional moments, and combine them with the known facts. The experiment begins early in Shama's book about the Parkman case. When he describes the governor wearily reading the letters and then standing up and walking to the window. Such a small detail, but by inventing the governor's actions, the historian had crossed a crucial borderline between history and fiction. But isn't that line crossed all the time? Why does it matter? Join us as we retrace the steps of a celebrated historian on his journey to apprehend the truth behind one of the most perplexing crimes of the 19th century. And let us challenge your preconceptions about what history is and how it is told. Eric, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, it's a pleasure. So tell us, why resurrect a story about a, a murder that happened over 150 years ago? Well, The Murder of George Parkman by John Webster is a classic Boston story that brings together all sorts of strands of Boston cultural history. And it never goes away. Books come out every few years, a lot of articles about it. And in our case, I was talking with a friend, Melissa Banta, who's a photo curator at Harvard. And she knew about some old daguerreotypes and drawings about the case and about the murder from back in the 1850s. But there were only about 10 images associated with it. And she was saying, well, do you think we could ever make a film about it? And uh, with 10 images, you can't make much of a film. So there was a bit of a problem with what to show. And then Simon Shama came out with a novella, kind of long, long uh, fictional article about the murder. And we thought, OK, that's the way to do it, if we can get him involved. He was a well-known historian, still is a well-known historian, but was at Harvard at the time. So just a quick snippet for the viewers. Uh, tell us about this murder. In November of 1849, one of the most uh, well-known and richest men in Boston, George Parkman, took a walk, as he did every morning. He'd go and collect rents. He was a landlord, even though he was also a physician. He had stopped being a doctor, was a landlord, basically. He would walk around Boston, around what is now the Mass General area, and collect rents. And on one particular day in November, right before Thanksgiving, he never came home. He just disappeared. He just disappeared. Vanished. And this was a man who everybody knew. He was well known on the streets. And that was the beginning of it. And a, a big manhunt as well. And a search for him ensued. What uh, mark did this play on Boston's uh, history? Just because Eric Shaw, I'm sorry, Simon Shama does say Boston at the time was the most morally sound city. Yeah. So Boston considered itself the Athens of America. It was the center of learning, and, and especially the medical circles at that time, because uh, the Harvard Medical School had been around for about 10 or 15 years. It was training the nation's doctors. Massachusetts General Hospital was even then famous for being in the vanguard of medical care. Ether had been invented. The first painkiller had been invented at Mass General just a few years before. So, so these people were very proud of themselves. And it turned out that one of them had murdered another, or at least was accused of the murder of another. And that shook all their assumptions about what could happen. These were the, the Boston Brahmins, the aristocrats, the richest and best educated and most moral, at least in their own minds, people in the country. So this was a national sensation. This, this yeah. event. Yeah. I mean, people call it the O.J. Simpson case of its day. It, it really was the story that gripped the nation in terms of crime. 
And as it turned out, I mean, as we found out when we were making this film, it, it came at a particular moment when Americans were beginning to get interested in murder stories and murder mysteries and sensation and all that kind of stuff. So to have a real life murder story that read and felt like a fictional murder story was very exciting to people. You have 10 images. <clears throat> how do you make a movie out of that? Obviously it involved a lot of reenactment. So talk about how you used those images and re reenactment to tell this story. Yeah, well, we were torn because historical reenactments are really hard to pull off on a documentary budget. And um, a lot of documentaries try, and a lot of times it looks pretty cheesy and not very convincing. And then the other way to do it is to just do sort of impressionistic things where you just show landscapes or rooms where something once happened and a lot of fog machines. And we didn't want to do that. We wanted to find some way to do real drama but do it on a documentary budget. So uh, one thing we did was decide to shoot black and white, mm -hmm. which both suited the story, we felt, because it has that film noir quality. But um, we also wanted to save money. Turns out black and white film stock, this was a while ago when you still shot on 16 millimeter film, black and white film stock was a lot cheaper than color film stock, cheaper to buy and cheaper to, to process. So we could save a lot of money, but make it look like a stylistic decision. And our, our director of photography, Boyd Estes, actually searched out the very same Kodak film stock that 1940s film noir movies were shot on so we could get as close as we could to that look. We realized early on that we were going to try to make a film that wasn't, that starts out being about this mysterious murder but actually ends up being about something else. And the something else is this question of how you can ever know for certain what happened in the past. So in terms of creating a documentary like this, where do you start? You have the idea, and then where do you take your idea, just for future filmmakers out there? Yeah. For historical documentaries, it's tough. There's not a lot of money. There's not private foundation money very often, uh, and there's not um, the usual sources. So the one place that does fund historical documentaries still is the National Endowment for the Humanities. It's torture to put together these grant applications, but in, you can get up to $600,000. So, How long did this whole process take when all was said and done? A year. I mean, it, it unfolded over a year once we started production, got the money. So, uh, And the, the actual shooting was the least of it because, of course, you want to concentrate that. It took a huge amount of planning, and it was really intense while we were doing it, but it only took a month or so. It's the, um, the editing that takes forever yeah. and uh, probably I don't know how many weeks exactly but at least 16 17 weeks maybe 20 so in terms of cutting up the film how did you decide what went in and what was on the cutting room floor yeah I'm mean, trial and error most editing is most film editing for documentaries uh, that don't have a script is a matter of trying all sorts of different avenues and often you'll spend a week going down a road and then realize Friday afternoon that was a waste of time start over again it's never really a waste of time because of course you learn a lot while you're doing it but uh, it can be a frustrating experience but it's also very rewarding of course in the end so for you yourself I mean you have a science and history background and then you were an editor or a writer for a long time how did you get into making documentaries well it started because I was a reporter for the Boston Herald and this was back in the 80s. And one of my beats as a reporter was the local documentary film scene and local filmmakers. And so every time somebody got nominated for an Oscar or something, I would go and do the interview. And I started to meet these local filmmakers. There's quite a big community in Boston of documentary filmmakers. And I really liked them. I realized these are nice people, and they're smart people, and they're doing great projects. And they worked together as teams. Every time I would interview one of them, they'd say, well, I'll talk to you, but you really should talk to the other person. That's the one who really, you know. So they were very collaborative. And um, I, I thought, they're having more fun than I was. <laughs> and, and the Herald was fun in a way, but um, I really wanted to get into film. It took about five years to make the transition. I so. started applying for grants. I would write up ideas and get them out there. And after about five years, I was making a living wow. doing films. 
Do you have any advice for aspiring documentary filmmakers? Yeah, it's a very different world now than it was back when I started because equipment has gotten so much cheaper, editing systems. I mean, when I started, a good camera was $40,000, <sighs> an editing system was $40,000, so you couldn't buy them. You had to wow. find people to lend them to you or work through different organizations like this one. I mean, that's my advice is to make a film. How do you how do you kind of fit in? I mean, as a as a filmmaker, how do you fit in with all the technolo technological changes that have been happening in the film world? Mm. Uh, it's tough, and we spend a lot of time talking about every time we start a project, what kind of camera are we going to use, how what editing platform are we going to use, all that kind of stuff. What are are we doing it on cards or tape? You know, there's there are a million things like that that never used to be issues. I mean, for years, people did it the same way. But it's good, too, because there, there are all sorts of avenues to do things. And it's so much easier now mm. to, to get through the editing process. It absolutely is. What was it like to produce a documentary for um, one of the most watched um, history series, American Experience? Mm. Well, it was the second one I'd done for them. And um, I know the people there quite well. So it wasn't difficult to work with them at all. I mean, they're very easy to work with. We had the advantage of having raised money through the National Endowment for the Humanities and through the Massachusetts Foundation for the Humanities ahead of time. So when we went to the American Experience, we had money in hand, which always makes a difference that they like that because obviously they don't have to pay for the whole film. And it gives us some more editorial freedom. They, when they commission a film from scratch from you, they essentially have total editorial control. When you come to them with the money and they put in finishing funds, but they didn't put in very much, then we had a lot more control. We still have to make it in a way that they like, or they're not going to show it. But um, uh, you know, we can, we can set the agenda a little more. And it's always great to have a show on that kind of venue. You get publicity, you get reviews, you get the kind of promotion that it's very hard to do if you're doing something on your own. Absolutely. How was this uh, storytelling process for you for this documentary? Well, it was wonderful to work with Simon Shama. I mean, he really is one of the premier historians of this era. So that was that that made the whole experience. And then doing the dramatic parts of it was tough. I'd never directed. I have since, but at that time, I hadn't directed these. They're not large-scale dramas, but still, we had a courtroom scene with fifty or sixty people had to get every person we could find, all our friends to come. We had to collect all sorts of strange clothes that wardrobe people could make look like like uh, mid-19th century clothes, because we couldn't afford the real thing. Wow, that's uh, really find interesting. Find a courtroom, <laughs> all that stuff. It's, it's a huge production, and uh, even to do it on a cheap, small scale. Talk about the most difficult part of um, creating this film structuring the narrative in a way where we had a mystery that wasn't really all that mysterious. We didn't have a new twist on the mystery, so somehow we had to still make it suspenseful. We had to tease it out in a way that would make people want to keep watching. And finding that balance took a lot of time in the editing room, a lot of writing and rewriting. It's not a story that we went into. We had a script when we started shooting, of course, but the script changed a lot. Yeah. And that was the tough part, is figuring out how to get that balance. How do you go around putting the music to the film? Did you have somebody compose a special? Yeah, I, I work with a now pretty well-known composer named John Kusiak. He's a wonderful composer. So he gets involved very early on. I mean, we use, usually the way it works is we take music that he's composed for other things, and he's got lots to draw from, the whole mm -hmm. library, and we use that as temporary music, temp music. And we use that as we begin to edit the piece, and then he comes in and talks to us, and. We talk about what works where and what needs to be done for each section. How important is it to have the correct or the proper music to tell a story in a documentary piece? I think for most documentaries it's key, it's crucial. Not all. Some documentaries, their strength comes because there's very little music, it's very sparse. But uh, in the case of Murder at Harvard, we felt the music was very important. and. Um, we, we don't have wall-to-wall -wall music, but we have a lot of music in it and, and a lot of really, um, I think, colorful and evocative music. What's the overall message that you would like your viewer to get to gather from it? 
Well, to get the money for this film, we had to write a lot of grant applications. And what we would always stress as the, the reason this film ought to be made is that it, it, it promotes historical literacy, meaning that it, it helps people understand better that the historical record isn't something that's completely factual. The, what happened in the past is a matter of interpretation. The way we understand it is so much a matter of who recorded it and who wrote it down and who, dis, who had an a particular agenda. And it's really important for people to know that, especially high school students and college students who often think that history is, is a bunch of facts that you just have to learn. But that's not what history is. History is about people's emotions and motivations and relationships and class tensions and racial tensions and all mm. sorts of things. And if you don't understand that, then you can never really understand what happened then or what's happening now. Do you think that this film added something to forensics in any way and what is being done today? That's a good question because it did, the, the case added a lot to forensics at the time. It was the first time that dental forensics had been used in a legal case and um, medical forensics came into play because they had all these body parts mm -hmm. and they had to try to identify them and they of course didn't have DNA. They didn't even have fingerprinting back then. Well, they didn't matter because there weren't any hands left. They yeah. were gone. <laughs> That wasn't part of it. But there were some pretty gruesome parts of the trial testimony where uh, doctors are trying to explain how you can tell what particular parts of a male body belong to who. It's, it's funny, but gruesome. And um, so our film didn't much shed new light on that as um, reminded people that forensics goes back away. C CSI kind of stuff goes back. And those were the days when they were first beginning to discover that that was an important tool in, in legal cases. Well, thank you so much for joining us and talking about murder at Harvard. Thank you and good luck to you, Eric. Thanks, Olga. And thank you so much for joining us on Behind the Dark Lens. We'll see you next time. I'm Olga Medvedev-Young.